So I begin talking to you about what makes something more vernacular by talking to you about materials. And the materials of these houses are tremendously important. The materials of this building are tremendously important. They're filled with information because the old technology was an ecological adaptation. It was a matter of taking the materials that existed around you and altering them in such a way as to make them submit to your will and to project into the world an idea of the humanity of you and your family, you and your community. It's how we want the world to be, but we entirely use the materials around us and those powers of society and of technology are powers that ultimately make the most vernacular building a perfect emblem of local control, local autonomy, whereas other technologies teach us that we're out of control and that we're a part of a big system, maybe tiny cogs, cogs and a great big clockwork that's grinding out wealth for somebody who just doesn't happen to be us. I return to Ireland. This is the place in I think not Ireland. This is the place in the world I know best. It's called Ballymenon, the place of the river's mouth. I spent 10 years knowing about this community, three square miles, 153 people. That's a little bit intense, but it's true. The top of this picture is my friend Peter Flanagan's house. Here is Peter in his house. And he is one of those people who told me that you tell the old from the new by the materials of which a building is built. The older built of native materials, the newer made of artificial materials. But he also said, and more subtly said, that the old houses and the new houses have different forms. He said all the old houses were built on the same model. It's an exact quote from Peter. Because he understood exactly the kind of typological energies that motivate vernacular architecture scholars. All the old houses were built on the same model, and his exemplified it perfectly. What's characteristic of that house is, though built of slap brick, locally made brick, though sheeted with tin, really the materials of the walls almost evaporate when you understand its plan because the house presents without facade its interior to the exterior. The exterior is not a facade, it's simply the consequence of the interior, the interior is a consequence of social action. Because if you know the rules, in these houses, in this place, every room has one window. Well, you know immediately how many windows, how many doors, how many rooms there are in this house. There's only one door, not a back door, there's only one. There's only one way to get into the house. It's what they call the hole the mason left. <laughs> it's your way in. But what you can tell by looking at this is you can understand exactly what lies behind those windows. Let's look where the chimney is. There's only one. And that means follow down from the chimney to the ground floor, and you'll know where the warmth is, where the heat is, where the fire is. Therefore, you'll know where everybody in this house is, because there's only one warm place in it. They're not fools. They're not going to be anywhere else. They're going to be in that, so that you would be able, I'm talking about Northern Ireland in the time of the Troubles, you'd be able to kill everybody in this house with a high-powered rifle from a great distance, because they're all sitting behind the window that you can see that's just to the left of the door. That's where everybody's sitting. And you know that when you go through that door, you're going to turn left because that's where warmth is. You're going to walk past Peter, you're going to turn left, and you're going to sit down at the hearth because that's where everybody's talking, that's where everybody's cooking, that's where everybody's eating, that's where everybody's doing anything at all. That's where they are. So that the house really doesn't cover its interior at all. This is a cross-section of Peter's house. And so if you come through the front door, you turn left to the fire, to the right is a dresser, to the left is a fire. There's one great big lofty room in the middle, which is the kitchen. There are two closed off little private rooms at the outside. Those are both bedrooms. All of life takes place in the one room, which is the kitchen. It's just like the hall of a medieval house, exactly from which it derives. So in this room, everything happens. And what's crucial about it is your admission to this room is immediate. When you pass Peter, one swing of the hip, you're in the kitchen. That's where everybody else is also. 
So this kitchen is organized around two points. One of them is the fire. The fire is never allowed to die out. It's always warm. The reason for that is simple. They kill the fire ritually on the first day of May, and then every fire for the rest of the year is made from the embers of the fire before, meaning there's a constant cycle from the first day of the year, which still in the Irish countryside is the first of May, not the first of January, that there's a ritual cycle, an endless repetition of fires on this hearth, and that means the kettle is always warm, and that means tea is always being made, and that means whoever steps across the threshold into the house is going to be made to drink tea. <laughs> no one says, would you like tea? They say, you'll take tea. There is no choice. Because if I come in, whoever I am, foreigner, British soldier, when I come in there, I'm going to have to sit down, I'm going to have to take tea, and I'm going to be put immediately under obligation to my host. If you're used to medieval literature, that doesn't surprise you about the way that works. If you've read Homer, you'll understand that this is exactly the way that hospitality works. It's not just kind, it's also an aggressive way to gather you into the social power of the person who is entertaining you, taking care of you, feeding you tea. You then have an obligation. You're given tea. You have to give back to the fire. That's the way they say it. Give back to the fire talk. Tea goes in, talk comes out, an exchange occurs. The thing that happens in that exchange is called a Cayley, and it's the moment in which the social world is invented through verbal art. It's not extravagant. It's not fancy and academic to say that the community is built through conversation and the conversation is a matter, largely a matter of tales, because that's exactly the way that Valley Men operate. You come in immediately, there's nothing to block you. You sit down immediately, there's nothing to stop you. You're not asked your name, you're fed tea. You take that tea in, you give stories out, and you become locked socially with the people of the house. Because the house is always open and because people are always coming in and going out and coming in and going out, it's dirty. You can't really, it's a terrible problem if you think about it from the perspective of your own lives. You can't really have a perfectly clean house and have it hospitable. You worry about who's coming in. You worry about their smoking cigarettes and dropping ashes on your, you know, come say rug. Something is going on along here. But if your front door is open and the front door is not closed, and if people are walking in and chickens are walking in and birds are walking in and everybody is walking in, if, for example, when you go away to the market and lock your door, you hang the key next to the door so anybody walking by can get in, <laughs> then it's vain to try to have a clean house. So you have a clean object in the house which symbolizes to you brightness, purity, and cleanliness. And that's the dresser. Elaine, of course, wanted Mrs. Cutler's dresser to be in this talk, and so of course it is. And there it is, Mrs. Cutler's dresser. And what's important about it? It exists in a smoky, dirty kitchen as an emblem of her ability to keep a clean house. It's clean. She washes all the plates on the dresser, none of which are ever used for eating. They've got nothing to do with eating, just like 17th century Delft or 15th century Italian place has got nothing to do with food. It has to do with display. The food, the plates for eating are in a little pantry out of sight. These plates are works of art. And they're set up to be works of art. No one has ever would, she can dream of eating off them. But she washes them like we wee babies every week and keeps them clean because they are the one place in her kitchen that she can prove to you who've just come in that she's a good house proud woman keeps a clean house. They also, like all ceramic things, have the potential for being the perfect gift. I've just been given by Cooperstown a plate. It's interesting. Think about, I mean, if you go back to how often ceramics are matters of our heirlooms, how often people give ceramics. It's the normal thing world over. This is one thing that connects Japan with England, England with Brazil is that ceramics are the thing to give. Why? Because they break so easily and they'll last forever if you care for them. 
They're perfect symbols of friendship. Well, every single plate on Ellen Cutler's dresser was given to her by somebody. And so when she takes them down and she washes them, she's literally renewing her social connections to the people who, the, the plate, the, the Queen's Jubilee from 1977 that's up to the left in that row was given to her by me. The next two plates were given to her by her neighbors, Tommy and P. Lunny. Every single one of those plates was a gift by a friend and when she washes them, she remembers those friendships, and when she takes care of those places, she takes care of those social relations. So that in that kitchen, there are two devices with which society is built. One's a fire where people drink tea together. One is a rack of plates which symbolizes the genealogy of the household. And this is her. This is Mrs. Cutler. That was her dresser. She lived in the most beautiful house in her community. Everybody agreed that she lived in the most beautiful house in her community, including herself. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got the grip on the old form now, and it's this. You can see that the front is not perfectly symmetrically disposed. Rather, the door is just offset enough to guide you exactly into where you're going to go. If you look at where, up where the chimney is and related to the door and the windows below, you can predict entirely what the interior of that house is like. Everything about it is not only known to you in a geometric sense, it's known to you in an emotional sense. When I step through that front door, I'm going to turn towards warmth, I know where I'm going. The house is not baffling your entry. The house is not setting up a facade between you and the and people on the inside. The house is not affecting privacy or alienation. What's the house doing? It's saying, come on in. There's no secret here. Everything is exposed. Everything is vulnerable. Well, that's the old house. This one even rarer that was literally built of clay instead of stone, but 100% local materials. The new house, materials are different, but what really is crucial is that where the old house was open and hospitable, and was ultimately constructed, I think this is not going too far, to answer our Lord's commandment to love our neighbor as ourself, and in that you shall live, the new house by its symmetry completely baffles entry. You know through which door you'll go, but where do you go once you get inside? There are now two chimneys. Everything about the house baffles your entry and misleads you. The house is moved from an open to a closed house. When? Why? Well, in this case, I know exactly why. This was built by a Protestant community, Protestant policeman in a Catholic community in literally the year 1900. That allows me to put this house in its builder Mr. Thornton, directly into history. 